be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions. Without objection, so ordered. As a reminder, please keep your microphones muted unless speaking. Should I hear any inadvertent background noise, I will respectfully request that the member please mute their microphone. And to insert a document into the record, please have your staff email it to documentti at mail.house.gov. Good morning and welcome to today's hearing on Coast Guard's leadership on Arctic safety, security, and environmental responsibility. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's hearing will be both Chairman DeFazio's and Ranking Member Gibbs' last hearings as members of Congress. Both have decided to retire. For 36 years, the House of Representatives has been a better place because of Chairman DeFazio's leadership and insight. This institution will miss him, and I will miss his friendship. Mr. DeFazio, thank you for your leadership, your mentorship, and your service to our country. And Mr. Gibbs, I want to thank you for your partnership and expertise as we work through this year's bipartisan Coast Guard reauthorization. I appreciated the bipartisan collaboration that we developed to do our subcommittee's work. And I appreciate the friendship we developed along the way. Thank you for your 10 years of service to our country as well. Today also marks 81 years since the attack on Pearl Harbor that led to our nation, led our nation to declare war within a day. To all of our veterans and active military families, thank you for your sacrifice and service to our country. Global peace is always tenuous. Today we will hear testimony from five witnesses who are experts on the Arctic, a region where security and geopolitics are both at play. Today we have experts before us to focus on the national security issues that are on the top of our minds, while others will enlighten us on the Coast Guard's leadership on maritime safety and environmental stewardship. Nearly 10 years ago, the Coast Guard published its first strategic plan for the Arctic region. The service updated this plan in 2019 to reflect its coordination with the White House, Department of Defense, and the Department of State, which showed a new level of interest in the status of the, of the United States as an Arctic nation. With Russia's recent aggression toward Ukraine, the geopolitical significance of the Arctic is even more pronounced. Although the Coast Guard security missions are critical, the service continues, continuously executes numerous other critical missions. The Coast Guard is responsible for maritime safety, that is, search and rescue, and aiding mariners in safe navigation by breaking ice marking channels, and communicating real-time weather hazards. The Coast Guard must also enforce environmental laws in the Arctic. This will become more and more important as melting sea ice means more shipping traffic, more oil pollution, and migrating commercial fish stocks. Coast Guard partnerships with Alaskans and indigenous peoples, with private corporations, the state of Alaska, and other federal agencies and countries have met a gold standard in the last 10 years. Coordination and cooperation are not optional at the North Pole. To help us appreciate the importance of all, the Coast Guard's Arctic missions, Admiral Gautier will be joined on a panel by the Honorable Michael Sfrega, the presidentially appointed chair of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, and Mr. Andrew Von Ah, Director of the Physical Infrastructure Team at the Government Accountability Office. The USARC is working hard to draw attention to the critical gap between the collection of data in the Arctic, weather, sea state, coastal mapping, and the Coast Guard's ability to use this information in its everyday operations. Similarly, 
The GAO has completed a number of studies in re recent years that measure the success of and gaps in the Coast, Guard, Coast Guard's Arctic operations. Today's second panel will feature an Arctic st strategic defense expert, Dr. Rebecca Pincus, director of the Polar Institute, and Dr. Martha Grabowski, a professor at Le Moyne College and a past chair of the Marine Board in the National Academies of Science. The Coast Guard has proven to be a nimble and resourceful leader for the U.S. in the Arctic. It can only fully implement its strategic plan if we fully grasp the full, the form and severity of the challenges Coasties face operating in such a harsh, remote part of the world. The Coast Guard plays a multi-dimensional leadership role in the Arctic. Fortunately, we have five witnesses before us with multi-dimensional expertise. Let's begin. First, I'd like to recognize Chairman DeFazio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for the kind words, and uh, thank you for holding uh, this hearing. We, we ignore um, the changes that are rapidly coming uh, to the Arctic North uh, at our own peril. And um, I'm pleased to see that we have a number of proactive uh, plans uh, in place, but you know, more is certainly going to need to be done. Um, although some deny uh, that climate change exists, uh, we are seeing uh, extraordinary extended periods of ice retreat, navigable waters uh, uh, throughout um, the Arctic region. And, uh, you know, we're now going to see, obviously, uh, transit, more transit of, uh, of, of freighters, uh, even um, even tour ships uh, in that area, which is obviously going to put uh, burdens on the United States Coast Guard uh, for their duties for both for security and uh, for protection of life and, and property. Um, I'm pleased after many years of struggle uh, that we have uh, two polar security cutters fully funded and we, uh, <clears throat> we are going to authorize another one in the Don Young Coast Guard Authorization Act. We're also going to authorize uh, the temporary utilization of an existing uh, commercial icebreaker under lease uh, so that we can enhance our capabilities. I mean, we've got uh, the Healy, uh, and then we have the one remaining, uh, and I know he's going to mix up star and C, but... Um, whichever one we have. Which is it, Admiral? Star, good, okay. <laughs> that, that was the one I was on. It's just too close together. I can never remember. Um, you know, which is patched together every year uh, after it does its major duty and run to uh, McMurdo Sound. Um, you know, I, it's interesting that, I mean, I, I guess they're still harvesting uh, circuit boards and things that we don't make any more with transistors off of the old Polar Sea, or they've been stockpiled somewhere. But it's pretty pathetic. I mean, Russia has 40. China, not even one of an Arctic nation, has two, and they're building more. Uh, this is going to be an era in an area of international uh, competition um, and potential issues uh, will arise. I mean, there are um, resources and claims being extended. Uh, the idiots in the Senate have been unable to approve the Law of the Seas Treaty, so we don't have a, a full standing to object to a Russia continually extending claims further and further uh, into the Arctic region. Uh, but, you know, nothing can be done about the idiots in the Senate. Um, so with the, with the Don Young bill, which will be hopefully tonight uh, or this afternoon as part of the um, Water Resources Development Act, which is now the Water Resources Development Act, National Defense Authorization, Coast Guard Authorization, and God only knows what else uh, is in that piece of legislation. Um, and then, uh, you know, there are other issues, um, bases, 
Um, you know, you're pretty distant uh, from the more northern, you know, because we only went there on a seasonal basis. And, um, you know, I understand that we're looking at um, an enhanced deep draft harbor. Um, you know, our naval, our, our Coast Guard air station is, again, pretty far away. So we're going to have to be looking at shoreside um, and seaside uh, facilities uh, to give us more proximity. Uh, and less uh, less travel time uh, to uh, to uh, get into that area. As the uh, chairman noted, um, this is my last hearing after 36 years. I started down there uh, somewhere, right about there, I think, uh, many years ago. Um, you know, this has been the, the honor of my life uh, to serve on this committee. Um, you know, had uh, great mentors, and particularly Jim Overstar. Uh, was an extraordinary mentor to me, and I hope I have mentored uh, some of the uh, the next generation. And I wish uh, Sam Graves, uh, who I fully expect to be the next chairman, uh, to uh, well on this committee. Um, and you know, Sam is uh, balanced and wants to get things done. So I'm I'm looking forward to see that this committee will still be productive. And to Bob, congratulations. I'm calling this the year of the great retirement. <laughs> a lot of people are retiring. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're joining that crowd, although I'm not going away. So I'm, I, I am going to be officially retired from Congress. And I want to thank my absolutely uh, incredible staff. Uh, can't name them all, uh, but they have done so much great work over the years. Uh, a member of Congress and this committee are, are only as good as the fabulous staff we have, uh, whether it's legislative, in, investigative, or just organizational. Uh, this is the biggest committee in Congress. It's a little bit unwieldy, uh, but I think we do pretty damn well. Uh, so with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now I would like to recognize Ranking Member Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, I thank the witnesses, too, for being here. I appreciate, uh, appreciate you being here. Um, I particularly want to thank, add my uh, thanks and respect to uh, both Chairman DeFazio and, and Ranking Member Gibbs. Um, this is their last committee hearing, and uh, their hard work and expertise from both of you um, are going to be missed on the committee overall and this uh, committee. I very much appreciated serving with both of you, and You've both done a lot of good things for the country uh, when it comes to uh, jurisdictions under under this committee. And I can only hope that Oregon and Ohio will be just as well represented uh, as you uh, as you move on. But uh, thanks for your service. Um, I do know this is an Arctic hearing, but uh, I do want to uh, uh, thank Admiral uh, Godier for what you are doing. And I want to remind you of the importance of getting the Barbers Point Aviation Facilities uh, completed. That's something that uh, that means a whole lot to me uh, when it comes to the next generation of aircraft and, and making sure that uh, um, that those maintenance facilities are are up to date. And I look forward to working with the Coast Guard to obviously complete uh, whatever uh, whatever's needed um, there at uh, uh, at the Barbers Point Station in particular. I know that Arctic uh, shipping routes were only available, um, unfortunately, for about three months. Um, during the summer along the, at least in the Northern Sea Route or the Northwest Passage, and I do know the changing conditions uh, in the Arctic have made maritime transportation uh, in the region much more feasible. Um, but I do know there's significant challenges associated with increasing that uh, vessel traffic in the U.S. Uh, Arctic and the Arctic Ocean uh, overall, and I do know that, sadly, the U.S. is woefully unprepared for the increased traffic that... Uh, uh, that we're going to see, but uh, I look forward to hearing from you all today and <clears throat> and reading your testimony. And and again, I appreciate you uh, you being in here. Um, the Coast Guard is uh, um, the Coast Guard means a lot to me, and and I know it does to the country. And so I want to make sure you all have everything that uh, that you need. Thanks. Yield back. Thank, thank you, Mr. Graves. I now will recognize uh, Ranking Member Gibbs. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to also thank you, you for your kind words, and then. Chairman DeFazio, for your kind words. And uh, one of my fondest memories I have is Chairman DeFazio, when I was looking for offices, 
I, uh, four, five, six years ago in, in the Rayburn building, I stumbled across Chairman DeFazio's office and he was gracious enough to show me his nice big balcony, <laughs> which I don't know if they let you out there anymore or not. I heard a... Yeah, yeah, but it was, but he was, he was so gracious to do that, you know, other side of the aisle, I appreciate that. I, that's a fond memory I have. It was, you probably don't even remember the, when it happened, but, and I think, uh, Ranking Member Graves, uh, for his kind words, and and uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, T and I committee will be in good hands next next starting January 3rd, and uh, Bob, we will be watching from afar. I will let you know if, how you're doing if you if you mess up too bad. But uh, but I've been on this committee since uh, 12 years ago when I first came to Congress, and I was uh, uh, privileged enough to be chairman of the Water Resource and Environment Subcommittee for six years, and I enjoyed working with the Army Corps and then now the Coast Guard, and, and uh, so it's memorable experiences, and I learned a lot. And uh, I didn't know a whole lot when I started those chair positions, and ranking member, but uh, so it's been wonderful. So I've, I've treasured those memories, so I really appreciate it. Um, uh, so Chairman Fazio, I wish you well, and, and you know, I don't know how many years you're here, but you got a team career, and I'm sure you'll do fine out in the West Coast. 36 years, so wish you well. Today, the subcommittee will hear testimony on the need for increased United States infrastructure to facilitate safe and efficient maritime transportation in the Arctic. For the first time in recorded history, more portions of the Arctic each year are becoming navigable. Vessel transits through the, the area covered by the Polar Code shipping increased 25% between 2013 and 2019 and are expected to continue. It is critical that we understand current traffic flows and the steps that need to be taken to ensure that both vessels and mariners and the environment are properly protected. One way to ensure better Arctic access is to increase the U.S. icebreaker presence in the U.S. Arctic. The Coast Guard has contracted, contracted to acquire new class of polar security cutters, the first heavy icebreakers built in the U.S. since 1977. Though, though this is a good first step towards more, morally fully implementing an active U.S. presence in the Arctic, these cutters are officially one year and unofficially two years behind their original construction timeline. The vessels will fall at least one more year behind their stated timeline, which was never realistic. In addition to the, the first cutters will conduct an Antarctic breakout and will not be available for work in the Arctic. So they're going to Antarctica first, I guess, and then back to the Arctic just so there'll be more delays for up there. In other words, we are nearly a decade away from increased U.S. icebreaker <coughs> presence in the Arctic. I look forward to the Coast Guard providing us a realistic timeline for when we can expect to see additional icebreaking capacity in the Arctic and what interim capacity measures the Coast Guard plans until then. However, while icebreakers provide important capabilities, there are many other issues that must be addressed to ensure safe and efficient Arctic navigation. Additional infrastructure and, and operational challenges to maritime transportation in the Arctic include limited satellite coverage or architecture to support voice and data communications, the lack of a deep draft port accommodating ships with draft up to 35 feet, unpredictability and flow patterns of icebergs and shipping lanes, the lack of channel marking buoys and other floating visual aids which are not possible during continuously moving ice sheets and scant hydrographic surveying and other data needed for safe navigation and resource protection and management. The United States is not alone in our efforts to facilitate safe commerce in the Arctic. We are part of the Arctic Council, along with other Arctic nations like Canada, Russia, and the Nordic countries. However, the Council's activities have been in abeyance since Russia's first invasion, Russia's invasions of the Ukraine. Russia holds the Council's chairmanship in 2022 and 23, and it's not clear what the Council's future is after that. Working together in a consensus-based intergovernmental forum allowed Arctic nations to promote environmental, social, and economic aspects of sustainable development in the Arctic. The Council was also critical to successfully implementing the International Code for Ships Operating in Polar Waters, the Polar Code. If the Council cannot be revived, we need to find other mechanisms to ensure international cooperation on these issues. This Arctic really is the last frontier, the portion of our nation's waters about which we still have much to learn. However, unless we can get the U.S. Coast Guard and other agencies' assets into the area, an expensive and time-consuming challenge, we will not be able to use these areas strategically. 
Thank you, Carmen, Chairman Chair Carbajal. We are work here on the committee and uh, uh, wish you all the best in the future. I yield back. Thank you, Representative Gibbs. I would like to now welcome our first uh, witness panel, uh, Vice Admiral Peter W. Gautier, Deputy Commandant of Operations at the United States Coast Guard, the Honorable Michael Sfrega, Chair of the United States Arctic Research Commission, and Mr. Andrew Vana, Director of the Fiscal Infrastructure at the Government Accountability Office. Thank you for being here today, and I look forward to your testimony. Without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. Since your written testimony has been made part of the record, the subcommittee requests that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Vice Admiral Gautier, you may proceed. Good morning, Chairman Car Carbajal, Ranking Member Gibbs, Chairman DeFazio, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm really pleased and thank you uh, for inviting me here today to update you on the Coast Guard's efforts on our Arctic strategy to promote safety, security, environmental protection for the Arctic. Uh, and I would like to take a minute to add uh, the Coast Guard's sincere appreciation, um, Chairman, um, for the service of um, Chairman um, Peter DeFazio for his distinguished service to the United States Coast Guard, as well as the ranking member, Representative Bob Gibbs. The Coast Guard owes a debt of gratitude um, to you both and to your distinguished and dedicated staffs. Under your leadership, the Coast Guard or the, the House passed two authorization, Coast Guard Authorization Acts, and we uh, were also included on two hurricane supplementals, CARES Act funding, as well as Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and many other things that have helped the Coast Guard. And before I left here today, Admiral Fagan, our commandant, asked to express her personal thanks to you both. The Coast Guard is better for your support of us. The Arctic is undergoing a dramatic transformation. Uh, the Arctic is undergoing a dramatic transformation of its physical, operational, and geostrategic environment. We're witnessing firsthand how the impact of climate change is opening up new access to Arctic waters. This drives greater activity in the Arctic region and with it, risk across the maritime sector. And the Coast Guard is deeply concerned about the rising strategic risk to our nation as Russia and China compete with diplomatic, economic, and strategic advantage and influence in the Arctic. While our missions in the high latitudes have evolved since we first started operating in Alaska and the Arctic in 1867, the Coast Guard's commitment to the region has not. We are operating forward to address the safety and security of our Arctic residents and mariners who make their living there, homeporting new cutters, investing in infrastructure and capabilities, prioritizing our operations, supporting research, and strengthening our international partnerships. Changing conditions in the Arctic are driving an increased demand for Coast Guard services. There's no question about that. And we have a sense of urgency to make sure we can deliver now and well into the future. Our actions are supported by the 2022 U.S. National Strategy for the Arctic Region and its four interconnected pillars. And this strategy is fundamentally supported by our 2019 Coast Guard Strategic Outlook. Despite the geographical remoteness, remoteness and logistical challenges inherent to all Arctic operations, the Coast Guard is meeting service demand through our flexible and expeditionary approach. This year in our Operation Arctic Shield, we increased seasonal presence in the U.S. Arctic to provide Coast Guard services across 65 remote communities. Together with federal, state, and tribal, and local stakeholders, we respond, responded to Typhoon Murbach to ensure numerous impacted communities could receive critical fuel and supplies ahead of the winter freeze. And in October, the Coast Guard Cutter Healy reached the North Pole for the second time to conduct important scientific research. Strategic competition across the Arctic is also driving demand for our leadership. Last year, Coast Guard Cutters intercepted four Chinese military vessels operating together in the U.S. exclusive economic zone off the Aleutians. And in September, we intercepted a com combined Russian 
Chinese task group of seven ships in a similar location. In both instances, the Coast Guard met presence with presence to ensure these ships operated in accordance with international law. The Coast Guard's strategic influence extends beyond the U.S. Arctic. We routinely conduct engagements with other Arctic nations and partners. And despite the absence of Russia in the Arctic Council and Arctic Coast Guard Forum, we continue to work with like-minded nations to advance shared interests in safety, environmental stewardship, and responsible governance. We appreciate deeply the continued support from Congress and this committee in particular to build the next generation of Coast Guard capability for the Arctic. A top acquisition priority is the polar security cutter, and we're working hard to advance that effort. We've asked for funding in this year's budget to increase near-term presence in, in the Arctic through acquisition of a commercially available medium icebreaker. With Congress's help, we're moving forward on this. Never before has Coast Guard leadership been more important to the Arctic. Thank you again, Chairman, for this opportunity. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Vice Admiral Gautier. Um, Dr. Sprague, you may proceed. Thank you. Chairman Carbajal, Ranking Member Gibbs, Chairman DeFazio, and members of this committee. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I'm Mike Sfrega. I am the chair of the United States Arctic Research Commission. It's an independent federal agency that advises Congress and the White House on issues related to Arctic research and related policies. I also sit before you as a resident of America's Arctic, the state of Alaska. I begin my remarks today by noting the U.S. Coast Guard and its forerunner, of the Revenue Cutter Service have a long history of supporting scientific research starting with the environmental observations of the noted naturalist John Muir, soon after 1867 purchase of Alaska from Russia. Our nation requires the Coast Guard's enduring support of federal research to protect and defend America's Arctic interests, to better understand the changing Arctic landscape and its implications, to inform prudent economic development, and to foster peaceful, stable, and a prosperous North. I note that while oceanographic research is not among the 11 statutory missions of the Coast Guard, it is indeed their sixth statutory primary duty. The Coast Guard advances scientific understanding of the polar regions in two fundamental ways. First, the Coast Guard itself supports a broad range of relevant basic and applied research, development, testing, and evaluation. And second, Coast Guard icebreakers provide scientists supported by many federal agencies, direct access to the Arctic. These vessels also have modern scientific tools and enhanced capabilities, much of which have been provided by other federal agencies. The U.S. National Strategy for the Arctic Region emphasizes two guiding principles relevant to today's discussion. First, plan for long-term investments, which means icebreakers. Second, commit to a whole-of-government approach. Clearly, Icebreakers that may cost $600 million apiece are significant national investments and assets, requiring interagency efforts for long lead time for planning, construction, outfitting. I turn my attention now to one of our nation's two icebreakers, the Healy. Over the past 20 years, most of the Healy's time at sea has been in support of research. But two challenges loom just over the horizon. First, in recent years, Healy has become less available to the scientific community because there has been an increase in missions and patrols directly related to priorities of the Department of Homeland Security. Clearly, these missions are critical to our nation's security and must continue. This inherent push-pull on the Healy's time in the Arctic demonstrates the ever-growing demands the Coast Guard has on it and that one single has upon it. This rebalancing of Healy's missions profile provides few alternatives to U.S. researchers other than to rely on foreign icebreakers for support. Second, Healy is now 23 years old with an original service life of 30 years. Healy will undergo a five-year service extension, but decommissioning is not far off. What vessel will replace the Healy? Will it be another Coast Guard vessel, perhaps an Arctic security cutter, for which there is no yet program of record? Regardless of uh, while the Healy's decommissioning may be seen far off, it's sooner than we think, particularly for those of us who think in icebreaker years. Planning for a replacement takes time, 
given the complexities of identifying interagency requirements, seeking authorizations and appropriations, procurement, construction, outfitting, sea trials, and so on. So my message today to you is, let's start now. And finally, I want to shift the focus and describe the soft power diplomacy that results from international scientific research and its value. Coast Guard icebreakers have long served as platforms for international scientific collaboration. By addressing common problems and sharing data when appropriate, the U.S. builds constructive relationships with like-minded nations in and outside of the Arctic, which strengthens the international rules-based order, the transatlantic alliance, U.S. and Canada, U.S. and Nordic cooperation, and cooperation throughout North America. The U.S. also benefits through access to new ideas, technologies, databases, and research partnerships. So in conclusion, I offer four suggestions. Government planning to ensure continued and enduring access to the Arctic Ocean needs to begin now, given the long lead time before delivery. Two, when the government procures new icebreakers, it should consider the broad mission sets and requirements of all applicable federal departments and agencies, and when feasible, incorporate them into vessel designs in order to advance the full range of our nation's Arctic interests. Three, specifically, multi-beam sonar systems should be standard hydrographic equipment installed on all U.S. icebreakers because the charts that they create reveal the depth and shape of the seafloor and provide information critical to safe navigation, economic development, weather prediction, coastal hazard assessment, coastal change analysis, fisheries habitat, and resource development. And finally, continue. Continue to support research enabled by the Coast Guard in order to reap the international benefits of soft power diplomacy. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Gibbs, thank you for, your op for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I do look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sfrega. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Von Bonna, you may proceed. Chairman Carbajal, Ranking Member Gibbs, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss our work on federal efforts to address gaps in maritime infrastructure in the Arctic. Climate change has led to record low levels of sea ice, making Arctic waters navigable for longer periods of time, leading to increased shipping activity. Data show more transits of the Bering Strait in 2021 than ever before. Increased shipping of natural resources extracted from the Arctic, growing demand for tourism and destination cargoes, and greater interest in transarctic routes that can reduce travel times may continue to drive activity in the region. These potential economic opportunities also bring safety and environmental risks, particularly given that the U.S. Arctic does not have the typical elements of a marine transportation system, such as a deep draft port, comprehensive charting of waterways, and robust communications infrastructure. These gaps in infrastructure exacerbate the inherent challenges of maritime activity in the Arctic, vast distances, dangerous weather, and unpredictable ice conditions, which pose risks to mariners as well as the fragile Arctic ecosystem. My statement today is based on reports we issued in 2020 and 2016, which had findings and recommendations related to addressing these gaps. In our 2020 report, we found that federal efforts in the Arctic lacked a current strategy with goals and measures, as well as interagency leadership. We therefore recommended that the Executive Office of the President <clears throat> develop and publish a strategy to address gaps in Arctic maritime infrastructure and designate an interagency mechanism responsible for leading federal efforts given that several federal agencies have key roles and responsibilities in the Arctic. In response to the recommendations, the White House reactivated the Arctic Executive Steering Committee as the mechanism to advance U.S. interests and coordinate federal actions in the Arctic. In doing so, it appointed an executive director and convened its first meeting in December 2021. Since then, the steering committee has met several times and has developed and approved eight interagency initiatives. One of the eight initiatives to advance safe and secure Arctic shipping is led by the Coast Guard. In addition, in October uh, 2022, the White House issued a national strategy for the Arctic region, which identifies needed improvements to maritime capabilities in the Arctic, including enhanced communications, mapping, charting, and navigational committees capabilities, as well as the need for a deep draft harbor in Nome, Alaska, and additional icebreaking capabilities. While the strategy establishes a vision for Arctic capabilities, it does not provide details on steps needed to achieve that vision or establish goals or measures for addressing gaps in Arctic maritime infrastructure as we had recommended. For example, although the strategy calls for investments in telecommunications infrastructure and the development of ports, it does not specify how agencies should prioritize these investments nor does it identify measures to assess progress. In November, the executive director told us that the process of developing an implementation plan for the strategy was underway. 
Encouragingly, he noted that for each major action of the strategy, the implementation plan should identify lead and supporting agencies, and the plan should also identify investment priorities and resources to implement the actions and a way to measure progress. By completing this plan and establishing goals and metrics, the federal government should have the tools to demonstrate the results of its efforts and decision makers could gauge progress in addressing these gaps. Our report in 2016 found that although the Coast Guard was taking some actions to implement its Arctic strategy, it did not have a systematic way to assess how its actions will help mitigate Arctic capability gaps. We therefore recommended that the Coast Guard, as it develops an implementation plan for its strategy, also develop measures for assessing its progress. As of December 2022, the Coast Guard is uh, continuing to update its implementation plan. The plan is expected to provide the foundation for assessing its efforts, although Coast Guard officials did not identify a timeline to complete the plan. Better understanding its progress and addressing capability gaps will be important given the Coast Guard's recent and planned investments in icebreaking capabilities. The Coast Guard plans to invest an estimated $13.3 billion to acquire, operate, and maintain three heavy polar icebreakers. And by tracking its progress and addressing its icebreaking and other capability gaps, the Coast Guard will be better positioned to understand how to support these assets and what level of infrastructure and support investments are ultimately needed. Moreover, the Coast Guard has an important opportunity to coordinate the completion of its plan with the recently released national strategy. Coast Guard's multi-mission role and its presence in the region gives it a central role to many federal efforts. Taking such, act, such action will position the Coast Guard to understand how to allocate its resources and prioritize activities to help achieve the national goals in the Arctic region. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonnaw. We will now move on to member questions. Each member will be recognized for five minutes, and I will start by recognizing myself. Vice Admiral Gauthier, I understand that the closest deep draft port to the Arctic is in the Aleutian Islands, some 800 miles from the Bering Strait and some 1,000 miles from the Northern Population Center in Barrow. That means that unless an icebreaker happens to be nearby, a Coast Guard cutter or air aircraft would have to travel over 1,000 miles to a potential maritime search and rescue case. That clearly won't work. Please give us a sense of the magnitude of the investments that would be necessary for the Coast Guard to establish a year-round Arctic base and also what the benefits may be to doing so versus the Coast Guard's current seasonal operating approach. Mr. Chairman, so the Coast Guard's Alaska home port that launches our Arctic operations is Kodiak, and we deeply appreciate the Congress's support to continue the build out of Kodiak. I think the port you're referring to is Dutch Harbor, and we do operate forward from uh, pretty frequently from Dutch Harbor, Alaska. The Coast Guard currently hasn't identified a specific deep water port that we require as a home port, but we're really encouraged by sort of a whole government or interagency thoughts in terms of building a different uh, additional Arctic infrastructure like Nome that was mentioned in the national, uh, the new national strategy for the Arctic region. We will use those locations for our Coast Guard operations if those are built. Um, the further you get north, sir, to answer your uh, uh, first element of your question, the more expensive things get. Kind of figured that. Dr. Uh, Schrager, in your written testimony, you discuss how the Coast Guard's engagement with scientific research may be used to advance soft power diplomacy. How do you gauge the importance of the Coast Guard's diplomacy and soft power in a region where Russia and China have taken such publicly aggressive actions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As, as the Admiral noted, you know, presence uh, does a lot of things, including influence and, and match uh, our presence to others. The Coast Guard really is the tip of the spear for us in the north, whether we're talking about the Bering Sea or the Barents on either side of the North American continent. So to have the Coast Guard patrolling in those areas, my home off the coast of Alaska, or with allies in Europe off the coast of Iceland and Greenland, north of Norway and the Barents, it shows that the United States is engaged. Most of the time, we're engaged with our allies. This is a signal. It's not unlike 
a signal that NATO provides, where we have multiple partners. The United States enjoys partnerships and allies. Russia does not enjoy that. China does not enjoy that. We do. And so to bring together our Coast Guards with others does a number of things. Interoperability, tyranny of distance in the North is a thing to overcome, unlike others. So together, we can incorporate our interoperability. Two, having the presence there. Three, understanding that domain better. Although our Coast Guard has a long history, that domain is changing as we speak. So to have a presence there most of the year or all year around just projects U.S. national interests and projects our sovereignty over that area. Thank you. Mr. Van Ah, to what extent has the Arctic maritime trans transiting season been lengthened due to melting sea ice? Can you expand on how this lengthened season increases risk for the United States in terms of maritime safety and environmental stewardship? For example, how has the affected, how has this affected the personnel needs and resource allocations of the Coast Guard? Thanks for that question, uh, Chairman Carbajal. So recent data that we've looked at um, shows that it's increased from, you know, it used to be more around three months. Um, for several years, it was looking like it was five months uh, that was there, were, um, there was uh, access to that region. And most recently, uh, that increased to seven months um, based on the information we saw. So obviously, that puts pressure on the Coast Guard and puts demand on services for Coast Guard. Uh, whether it's you know potentially for inspecting new vessels crossing the Bering Strait to see that they're outfitted correctly, uh, incident response, uh, or uh, just for you know general security and safety in the region. Thank you. I now would like to recognize uh, Ranking Member Gibbs. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman, uh, Vice Admiral. Um, in the National Defense Authorization Act, which I guess we're going to vote on today, I think. Uh, there was a request for um, authorization for an uh, uh, icebreaker, um, and then also in the existing icebreaker, the major will waive certain contracting requirements to apply to the construction of these new new vessels. Assuming the funds are provided for the requested auth acquisition, how long do you expect this acquisition to take, and um, what additional funds would be required to refit this vessel for Coast Guard use in the Arctic, and when do you expect such a vessel to be available for service? Uh, first off, ranking member, we really support congressional, uh, enjoy the congressional support that we're getting on the commercial uh, icebreaker acquisition and for the relief needed in order to field it more quickly. So our plan for this, and it is a bit of a voyage of discovery, we just haven't purchased commercially um, in the Coast Guard, and we traditionally don't do that, is once we can uh, get the, the money to acquire it, is to do a phased-in approach so we can do some just very initial work on it to make it a basic Coast Guard cutter. So some basic damage control, basic command and control, um, and a paint job and uh, staffing to uh, make it a Coast Guard cutter so we can field it in the Arctic as quickly as possible. We think that in a phase and approach over two years, we can make it then continue to build it out into the type of Coast Guard uh, cutter that we need it to be with the full suite of requirements met so that we can then home port it in a location where it will be operable um, in the Arctic. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Sarvaga, uh, did I say that right? Sarvaga, okay, thank you. Um, the issues, uh, the Coast Guard, the, uh, the high spring, the, you know, the Coast Guard's kind of pretend about the Healy replacement is unrelated topic, but you know, and designing an Arctic security cutter, also a Great Lakes icebreaker. Um, do you believe that the Coast Guard cutter Healy, which is used for Arctic research, should be recapitalized, either by providing for a fourth polar security cutter, assigning an Arctic security cutter to the mission, or designing purpose-built research icebreaker, or using an array of unmanned platforms and other uh, investments uh, to deal with that issue? Do you understand? Thank you, Ranking Member. If I understand the question, the question correctly, uh, it's it's a uh, Arctic security cutter versus unmanned. Some of that, yeah, okay. and then I think to, uh, our pardon, or polar, and or polar security cutter, and more polar security cutters. Well, you know, the hearing today is about the Arctic, and I know the polar security cutters, the heavies, will likely go down to the Antarctic. It doesn't preclude them to going north, 
But in terms of the research community, we really do need those assets north. So we, we would advocate for an Arctic security cutter to be outfitted to support research to head north sometime sooner rather than later. As I said, the Healy is going to phase out in a very short period of time in the icebreaker life. So we're concerned about what happens then. Not that you should take away from the portfolio of a polar security cutter program, but the fact is our nation needs a reliable Arctic security cutter, something like the Healy. If we do not have the Healy, we will not have capacity. Okay, so, so I guess what you're saying, you favor the Arctic security cutter instead of having a polar research vessel to, to operate in both Antarctica and Arctic? You want, one to, you want the other vessel that'd be just uh, uh, in the, operating in the Arctic. The research community would like to have a dedicated icebreaker okay. in the north that we could rely on to conduct our research. Okay. Okay. Um, Vice Admiral, I want to bring this up. Um, our late esteemed uh, deceased Chairman Don Young represented Alaska for almost 50 years and uh, had an issue at the, um, up at the St. George. Um, there was a facility that was housing a helicopter for search and rescue, I believe. Uh, and I think anything close to that was more than 400 miles. And the, and the Coast Guard had a lease agreement and, they, and, the, and, the, and the locals didn't maintain the roof and lease and things kind of fell apart. What's the status? It seems to me that with the, the, the environment up there and the distances that it's probably pretty much pretty important thing to have that capability of that helicopter for rescue missions. Uh, and so on. Uh, is the Coast Guard planning on re-entering a lease and, and, and making sure that the, the facilities kept up? And, and what, what's your thoughts on what, what the movement, what, what your plans are? It is important for the Coast Guard to have that location in St. Paul Island with the hangar so we can pre-stage helicopters um, out of that location, especially as we see fish stocks migrating further north and the fishing fleet is following that. St. Paul Island is just an important location where we can um, conduct our missions more readily with that with the fishing fleet. So uh, we understand that um, in the in the draft authorization um, bill, there's some language that might provide us a degree of relief that will enable us uh, to continue to use that, and uh, we do commit to using that facility. Okay. Will, you, will you commit to uh, prior to January 31st of next year uh, entering in a lease that you will? Uh, brief the uh, subcommittee staff on that issue before you enter into a lease. So, so if I understand the question, um, w with the relief provided under the uh, off bill, that we would continue the leasing of that hangar so we yeah, can operate. Yeah, I think the uh, subcommittee center. staff's looking at it as a, as a briefing from uh, from your folks uh, uh, prior to signing the lease. I think to to, to understand what what the plan is, because I think the concern is we want to enter into a lease that. That with the incident that happened with the damaged hangar won't happen again, and we won't be left without having that uh, capability in that area. Right. Yeah, we really look forward to a future where we can resolve the issues so that we can use a hangar that's appropriate. Yeah, I understand that. Coast Guard I think you, I think the community staff wants to be kept up to speed. And Absolutely. Make sure, make sure that they, they want input in the, and make sure the lease is what is going to work. Certainly. I think that's. I yield back. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. And I would like to recognize Chairman DeFazio. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman, uh, Vice Admiral. Um, uh, you weren't around then, but I objected uh, to the uh, icebreaker contract with Halter that had never, ever built anything like that before. And I said, this is a really dumb idea. I still don't know why it happened. And luckily, they've now been taken over by a company that actually has built and can continue to build ships and has built a bunch of uh, Coast Guard boats with never a single defect. So I just caution if we, um, you know, I'm hoping uh, that the Coast Guard will finish its uh, evaluation on the ASCs. I don't see how you're going to get by without them. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the Healy's kind of getting old and could use some modern replacements. And I think there's going to be a lot of work. I mean, how far away do you think you are on finishing an evaluation of the need for the ASCs? Well, certainly your counsel um, is, is incredibly valuable given your history on this topic. Um, our focus is on the polar security cutters at the moment, as you've said. Uh, we do intend on forming a program of record in the future where we can examine requirements for a follow-on Arctic security cutter, a medium 
um, icebreaker to provide us the sort of fleet mix and flexibility that we think we need. That is out in the future while we continue to focus on our, our preeminent acquisition, the PSC, plus now with the support of Congress, bringing on this commercial medium icebreaker into the fleet. Right, well, I, I mean, the PSCs are, they're, they're going. I mean, you know, all you need to do is oversee it, and now you have someone who can actually build ships. So it's not gonna take a lot of work, unlike that, that other company. Uh, but um, the, uh, the commercial, I think you've already addressed the commercial acquisition and the potential for that, and I understand that's gonna take some time. But I would hope then you immediately move on uh, to ASCs. Uh, I, I have some sense of, of haste. I just really think even with uh, when we finally get to three uh, functional, modern, uh, major uh, icebreakers, I mean, you've still got the, the Antarctic mission, um, you know, and, and other things. I, I think the, the flexibility that the smaller ones uh, afford uh, is going to be absolutely necessary, and I just hope that there'll be a, a real focus on that. I'm also wondering, are you looking at interesting or new technologies uh, for the region, whether that would be, you know, a, you know, a, some unmanned, uh, you know, alien, uh, alien <laughs> aviation surveillance or things like that, uh, so that, you know, to extend sort of your, your, your look in that region? Yeah, we, we certainly are, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think you, the use of UAS is gonna expand the eyes and ears that are, will just help us perform our mission that much better. The other thing that we continue to um, actually make some progress on is communications in the high latitude, which has been a historical challenge given just the nature of operating up there. And we are making progress along those lines too. So um, in the Arctic region, I mean, Satellite communication is, I mean, just because of where you're at, doesn't, there's no real good satellite communication? Actually, there's been progress that's being made both with the Department of Defense uh, and, the, and commercial industry. Space Force just launched two um, satellites that can provide some secure communications and improvements in the high latitudes. And there are a number of commercial concerns that continue to launch constellations that, are, that will cover the high latitudes. So. Okay. Actually, we're quite encouraged along those lines. Great, great. That's going to fill in. That's going to fill in some gaps. Um, that's it, Mr. Chairman. I yield back to balance my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next, I will recognize Representative Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I too want to add my word of thanks to Peter DeFazio for chairing the committee. And he's not paying attention, so I'll have to I'll have to kill time here, which is okay for a congressman. You know, we have a saying: "Why well, use four words when eight will do?" And so, Mr. Chairman, I was just saying uh, we're going to miss you. Uh, I went on a codel with you and Murray over to the Europe T and I committee. It was a great fun, and it was very well organized and very well done. I think Kathy uh, probably had a lot to do with that. <laughs> But uh, I wish the best for you <clears throat> and Bob Gibbs. I'm, we're going to miss you. I remember when I was a freshman, came up here the first time, uh, I parked in your parking space because I didn't know better. And you were very gracious. <clears throat> and I'm, I've never recovered from that because I'm getting paid back every time there's a new crew. They seem to park in my parking space. But anyway, uh, thank you all. Congratulations for a job well done. A couple of questions, if I may, uh, I guess to you, Vice Admiral. Uh, we have a company called GovLink that's working on a project in Missouri County. Uh, and at a previous hearing in April, in April of this year, Mered, Acting Administrator Leslie, stated on the record that the USCG Environmental Review and Mered Record of Decision for Texas GovLink, you may have to do a little checking on that, Texas GovLink, would be completed at the early part of 2023. And of course, their question, as you might have supposed, is are we on track with that? Do you have any knowledge of that? I, I do have knowledge of that, and, and that's right. Um, the Coast Guard is tightly coordinated with Merritt in their lead federal agency role in the permitting of this project. We're providing Merritt with information so they can conduct the env environmental analysis. On our side, the Coast Guard has responsibility for doing things like reviewing their operations plan and making sure they comply with the safety and security regulations. They need to do a risk analysis and some other things. So those efforts will continue on the Coast Guard side without delay, sir. All right, I appreciate that. And secondly, 
Uh, on November 17th, Representative Babin and myself uh, wrote a co the Coast Guard letter with questions uh, regarding the, the VT halter. Does, does the contract that the Coast Guard approved for VT halter require that U.S. law is followed in all aspects? It does. It does. Has the Coast Guard contacted TV Halter to instruct the company that they need to resolve the question of proper licensing for the, the, the use of patented technology? I think in general, uh, in working with VT Halter, we reinforce the fact that they need to comply with law. I think with, with on the particular instance that uh, you might be referring to, my understanding is that, that there might be a complaint about a certain patent infringement to date, the Coast Guard or, nor DOD, are, uh, the Navy, have received um, through channels uh, a complaint from, on any patent infringements, but we understand that something might be out there, and when we, if and when we receive something, we'll act uh, appropriately and take it seriously. So you know that it's out there, and during the recent purchase of ET Halter by Ballinger Shipyards, Y'all did a review of that purchase, right? Well, we Guard. haven't we haven't actually received uh, a patent infringement complaint, sir. Nothing at all. Well, you're aware of that patent licensing issue. So was that included in the Coast Guard review of the sale? The uh, possibility, if nothing else. Not not to my knowledge specifically. No, okay. Do you know when we could have anticipate? and anticipate an answer to these questions. Could you look into that? You said not to your knowledge. Well, we, we, certainly, sir, we could. Um, but I think it's important that um, any, any entity that might have a patent infringement complaint needs to make that complaint to the federal government through, through channels. Okay, but you're aware of it. It just has not come through the right channels to you? Uh, it, it has not been received by the Navy or the Coast Guard through our integrated program office. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Appreciate your response. Appreciate what y'all do. Uh, my oldest and longest, well, my youngest and longest living uncle, Vernon Weber, was a Coastie, ah. and he's 92 and uh, living up in Woodville, Texas, and so we appreciate you guys, and with that, I will yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Weber. I will now recognize um, Representative Larson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Admiral, uh, first for you, this is somewhat related to Mr. Fazio's questions, but I wonder if you can be more specific. Uh, in, in 2018, the Homeland Security Operational Analysis Center identified a number of interrelated capability gaps that could challenge the Coast Guard's ability to operate in the Arctic, uh, including voice and data communications and sensor coverage. And I uh, was curious uh, what steps the Coast Guard has taken to address those gaps, and is there anything yet that needs to be done? Sir, we've um, issued a contract for second generation Coast Guard communications capabilities across the entire fleet of Coast Guard cutters, not just um, the ones that will be operating in the Arctic. And as part of this, we continue to work closely with DOD, like the, this in the Space Force example that I mentioned. Uh, where they're providing some additional coverage through their constellation in the polar regions for, for uh, military-specific secure communications. In addition to that, working with um, uh, directly with other commercial providers and then other entities like uh, DHS Science and Technology, we're exploring efforts um, for commercial satellite um, provision. In fact, the Polar Star, which is um, a couple of days out of Australia, headed down to Antarctica, Antarctica is carrying a commercial satellite ca uh, receiving capability on it for operation in uh, Antarctica. Is that going to be, uh, is that experimental or is that prototyping or is this a? It, it is, we're essentially, you know, we're ex experimenting with a couple of different options and this one is just an easy commercially provide, uh, commercially available one. It'll enable the crew members to, you know, communicate back with their families and things like that. With regards to Space Force, uh, the Space Force capability, without getting too far into this, uh, in this setting, is that strictly a military military communications capability for for national security uses only? To my knowledge, it is. If you're not okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of commercial or safety, environmental um, uh, purposes, your your communication and sensors aren't are you haven't developed those capabilities to address these other missions of the Coast Guard in the Arctic region? Congressman, we're improving. We're not necessarily where we want to be or need to be. We still think that we have gaps 
But the good news here is that the commercial, in particular, the commercial capability are being fielded pretty quickly um, to be able to close those gaps. Yeah, and uh, so related to that, the commercial fishing industry supports a lot of jobs in, in my state uh, and uh, in Alaska, obviously. Um, a lot of uh, folks, uh, you know, they, they, live, they live in the Pacific Northwest during the uh, winter and fish yeah. up north in the summer for obvious reasons. Uh, the Coast Guard plays a pretty key role, though, in responding to spills and uh, other environmental pollution incidents that have, could have an impact on the quality of, the, of fishing. Um, there are techniques to remove oil from ice-heavy landscapes, and they're still un but those are still underdeveloped. Has the Coast Guard taken any action to put any work into developing those techniques? We are. Um, through our research, research, the Coast Guard's research and development programs and the network we then have through other elements like DHS Science and Technology and other research institutions. The Coast Guard's been working on some solutions, in particular for ice-covered waters in the Arctic, uh, recently tested a, an underwater um, remote vehicle that could detect oil sub uh, ice. And so things like that we're proceeding uh, so we can close some of those gaps. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Von Ah, your testimony recommended the Coast Guard develop measures for assessing how its actions have helped mitigate capability gaps and design and implement a process to address progress. Uh, are there specific gaps that can be addressed more quickly um, if recommendations are implemented? Uh, well, thank you for that question, um, uh, Representative Larson. Um, I don't know if we've done the work to say whether or not there are certain gaps that should be could be addressed more quickly. Certainly, um, what we're looking for in our recommendations is the ability for these agencies to be able to prioritize their uh, investments relative to the goals that we're trying to achieve in the Arctic that are laid out in the Arctic Maritime Strategy and in the Coast Guard's case in their own, uh, in, in their agency uh, Arctic Strategy. Uh, so we haven't seen their, you know, an implementation plan yet from them in terms of how they're going to go about, you know, what, what specific plans and what goals they have. We understand it's under, you know, still, still being developed. And so it's hard to say exactly which ones could go more quickly, but I think that's sort of what we are hoping to see in their, in their, in their plan. Uh, with that, thank you. I'll, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Larson. I will now recognize uh, Representative Auchincloss. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I'd like to focus on the Arctic Council and what Russia's war in Ukraine means for the alliance. The Arctic Council, as you all know, is a consensus-based intergovernmental forum made up of the eight Arctic nations, six indigenous peoples, organizations, and a variety of other government and non-governmental partners. Russia was scheduled to chair the council from 2021 to 2023, but was suspended from all participation due to its invasion of Ukraine. Vice Admiral, a uh, question for you. Um, accepting as a premise that the Arctic Council is an important international convener for the maritime community uh, and serves US security and economic interests, um, what is the Coast Guard planning to do to fill the void of leadership left by Russia at the Arctic Council? The Arctic Council is indeed an important international forum to maintain the sorts of um, um, free and open and uh, stable Arctic waters that we all hope to enjoy. So when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, uh, uh, Arctic Council activities were suspended for a time. But then the remaining council members uh, got together absent Russia and put together a work plan with some projects to continue as they can, as we can, to move forward on some of those, um, some of those items. Uh, so Norway takes, uh, becomes the chair of the Arctic Council in April um, of next year, and there are discussions about what a work program moving forward might look like for the Arctic Council in the future. The Coast Guard has no assets permanently stationed above the Arctic Circle compared to Russia's six Arctic bases and 14 newly built icebreakers. So, Given these limitations, um, what can Congress do to support us asserting our leadership with this vacuum that's being created in the Arctic Council? Uh, well, uh, in terms of um, not, uh, not having a home port, so to speak, above the Arctic Council, continued support for the types of investments that we've requested in terms of basing of our polar security cutters, in terms of uh, other home ports, uh, things like uh, you've supported in Kodiak are tremendously important. So the State Department leads our delegation to the Arctic Council, and I think just general uh, government, uh, congressional support of what U.S. government does in the Arctic Council is helpful. Likewise, 
we have a more preeminent role in the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, which is different but related to that. And our conversations with respect to oil spill response, search and rescue, and other things that we do in the uh, Ar uh, Arctic Coast Guard Forum, we hope to move forward under uh, Norway's chairmanship in the future too. Good. So in addition to Russia being increasingly aggressive, they released a naval doctrine in August that emphasized the Arctic Ocean's importance to the country, and I already talked through their assets that they have. Uh, China is also increasingly assertive. In February 2022, Beijing and Moscow pledged in a joint statement to increase cooperation on sustainable development in the Arctic, and in September, Chinese and Russian warships conducted a joint exercise in the Bering Sea. In September, the USCG Cutter Kimball was on patrol when it identified a Chinese-guided missile cruiser about 75 nautical miles north of Alaska's Kiska Island. How are you redistributing your assets and patrols given increased activity and demonstrated interest by the CCP in operating in the Arctic? So um, our Coast Guard uh, District 17 commander has created an operation called Frontier Shield. And what we've done is, uh, so with the decommissioning of our high endurance cutters, our 378s, we've operated more national security cutters in the region in terms, in, in addition to the Coast Guard cutter Healy. And we're on patrol in a way where we can get through intelligence means in the Department of Defense sort of an advance warning of where we might be confronting or seeing these surface action groups so we can position ourselves the right way so we can meet their presence with our presence to make sure everyone is complying with international rules and norms. We need to make it absolutely clear, and not just in the South China Sea, but also clearly in the Arctic as well, that the United States Navy and Coast Guard is going to ensure that international waters are a global commons and that are to be uh, navigated free of, of um, of incursions by, by CCP. It, it needs to be uh, absolutely unequivocal. And to, this, to the extent that you need support from Congress in doing so, I, I hope that you'll be forthcoming. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Arkenclaus. Next, I'll recognize uh, Representative Garamendi. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the privilege of uh, joining your committee for this hearing. Uh, the uh, Arctic is, should be on all of our minds. I know the Coast Guard has been trying to uh, provide the necessary uh, activities in the Coast Guard for a long time, um, and unfortunately has not been able to develop the necessary vessels, basically icebreakers of various kinds, uh, to do the job. I want to focus on the icebreaker issue, which was discussed earlier, and uh, so I'm going to do it again. Uh, what is the current status of the one heavy icebreaker that is under, or soon will be under construction? When do you expect it to be completed? Sir, so you're referring to the Polar Star, I believe. Uh, the status of the Polar Star, actually, a few days out of Australia on its way. No, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. sorry, not that. That one is the only one you have, but the new one that you intend to build. Uh, oh, on, on the Healy or yes. the... Well, let me put it more Oh, on the Polish security, you have, uh, my apologies. You are authorized and you have money to build an icebreaker. Right. What is the status of that uh, for, Forgive me, sir. Um, okay. I understand the question. So um, in terms of the Polish security progress, in terms of, of construction, um, we do know that the, it is taking longer than we anticipated to complete for the shipyard to complete the detailed design phase of the Polar Security Cutter project. This is a crucial phase that needs to happen right, especially on the first of class icebreaker before we can move together with construction of the first PSC. So having said that, um, it's unlikely, sir, that um, the lead PSC will be delivered uh, during fiscal year 25, which I think might have been the latest update from the Coast Guard on that, and that's what's in the contract. And in fact, we assess that there's considerable schedule risk even for delivery in fiscal year 26. So we're looking beyond 25. We are. Any idea how far beyond? You say um, there's risk in we, the schedule? We want, sir, we want to give you a precise estimate of what that uh, looks you, like. And we you, won't. You've not been precise in the past, so just give me a range. We're we talking yeah, 30. It, we, we need to evaluate what this detailed design phase, how long it's going to take. When will you it, come it'll, back to us with that evaluation? We're, we're at risk to be into fiscal year 27, sir. So what do you intend to do between now and then, that being, uh, what, six years from now? 
we're, we're continuing to compress the schedule wherever we can on the acquisitions. We've asked, as you know, for funding in, in this fiscal year to um, purchase a commercially available medium icebreaker. And what is the status of that purchase? I assume that's uh, the choice. P pending the fiscal year 23 budget passage, sir, we intend on um, doing a quick evaluation and moving forward on an acquisition for that and then moving into a phased-in process so we can get that into the Arctic as quickly as we possibly can. And your proposed schedule to accomplish that is? We, we think it'll be a phased-in two-year schedule before we can have it homeported, uh, permanently homeported and operational. We hope that we'll be able to actually operate that particular uh, icebreaker sooner than two years from now. Okay, do you have a specific work plan to accomplish that? Uh, we have a lot of, de honestly, a lot of details to be filled in on that. We need to take a deeper look at the icebreaker that uh, will You've be not yet done a deep look at it? Sorry? You've not yet done a deep look at that icebreaker? We have done an initial evaluation of this particular icebreaker, but uh, pending an acquisition, it'll enable us to put together a much more. Please. Understand this committee for at least the decade that I've been involved in it wants you to have icebreakers. Don't dance with us. Give us the specific information we need to make it happen. You're going to need law. You're going to need money. You're going to need acquisition authority. You've got to give us the precise information. Don't dance around. I, I, you're, you're very good at dancing. You haven't given me a solid answer on anything yet. But you've got to be very, very precise. This ship has been before you for more than a year. And yet you've not done a detailed disc look at what it's going to take, or maybe you're not willing to give us the information we need so that we can help make it happen. Now, there are other icebreakers that are available from foreign countries, specifically Finland and Sweden, that have offered to lease, long-term lease, icebreakers to the United States. Have you looked at that possibility? We have looked at, at that uh, possibility previously. Obviously, we'd need to have some statutory relief to buy American in order to do something like that. We understand that. We know the law. We write the law. We understand. We also understand we got a very serious problem in the Arctic. We don't have the ability to patrol the Arctic unless the Healy is available and it's going to go into a shipyard and won't be available until just towards the end of the Arctic summer season. Correct? That's standard. I'll just tell you, I'm very disappointed. I'm very, very disappointed. We've been at this 10 years, and, you're, and the Coast Guard is still dancing around. You've got to come to us with a solid plan. Here's what we need. We need it by this date. Here's how we can get it done. And yes, you're going to need authority to do that, but you're not going to get authority until we know that you've, that what it is and how the plan works. So please, I'm 10 years into this. I'm pretty damn tired of the dancing around. Okay, now, what is the follow-up for the heavy icebreaker that is perhaps going to be done sometime between 2027 and 2030? What's the plan for the next follow-up? Um, so we, we intend on opening up a program for a, a follow-on icebreaker, the Arctic Security Cutter is what we're calling it, as you know, the a medium icebreaker. And? You intend to? We intend on creating a program of record in order to do that. Our focus is really on the polar security. Sir, if I might, 30 seconds. So where have you, commit, have you communicated with this committee about what that plan is? I don't think we've provided details yet because, quite frankly, we need to develop those details. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Garamendi. If there are no further questions, I thank the witnesses from our first panel and we'll now, we'll now call up panel two. Thank you very much.
Welcome. I would now like to welcome our next panel of witnesses. Dr. Rebecca Pincus, Director of the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center, and Dr. Martha Grabowski, Professor at Lemoyne College and Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I hope I pronounced that right. And former chair of the Marine Board at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Thank you for being here today, and I look forward to your testimony. Without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. As with the previous panel, since your written testimony has been made part of the record, the subcommittee requests that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Dr. Pincus, you may proceed. Thank you. Chairman Carbajal, Ranking Member Gibbs, and distinguished members of the committee, I am honored to appear before you today as director of the Wilson Center's Polar Institute. In keeping with the global policy-focused work of the Wilson Center, I offer the following comments on the U.S. Coast Guard's Arctic missions in the context of U.S. national interests and objectives in the Arctic and beyond. My argument is threefold. First, that in the global context of long-term strategic competition, the Coast Guard is an effective means for strengthening relationships with allies and partners and for competing with adversaries via the integrated deterrence framework established in the National Defense Strategy. Second, that the U.S. has clearly identified the Indo-Pacific as the priority theater and Europe as the secondary theater of strategic importance, and the Arctic must be understood in that strategic hierarchy. And third, for a number of practical reasons, the Coast Guard is a cost-effective means to pursue multiple national interests in the Arctic. The Coast Guard's missions in the Arctic take place in the global context of geopolitical competition, with China as the pacing threat, while Russia is broadly viewed as an acute threat. The 2022 National Defense Strategy establishes the concept of integrated deterrence as the chief means of engaging in holistic competition with both China and Russia. The Coast Guard can play a unique role in integrated deterrence. In the Arctic and beyond, the Coast Guard is a welcome partner on a host of issues of shared concern. From search and rescue to fisheries enforcement to drug interdiction, the Coast Guard is a partner welcomed by countries around the world. The top maritime concerns of many partner nations are bread and butter U.S. Coast Guard missions, enforcing fisheries regulations, interdicting crime and terrorism at sea, and maritime safety and response. Coast Guard international partnerships enhance partner capacity, pave the way for U.S. access, and embody the vision of integrated deterrence enshrined in the NDS. In addition, clear identification I, I referenced above of the Indo-Pacific as the first priority and Russia and Europe as the second priority helps place the Arctic in context. In light of these priorities, the Department of Defense has identified stability in the Arctic as its desired objective and is taking a requirements-driven approach to calibrating its posture in the Arctic. In pursuit of stability in the Arctic, the Coast Guard has an important role to play in the National Defense Strategy concept of campaigning, defined in the NDS as the conduct and sequencing of logically linked military initiatives aimed at advancing well-defined strategy-aligned priorities over time, campaigning in the Arctic should not contribute to escalation. The Coast Guard is well-positioned to campaign without escalating, as white-hulled Coast Guard vessels are inherently less escalatory than Navy warships. Finally, given the extra costs associated with achieving and maintaining U.S. government presence in the Arctic, it is imperative to achieve maximum results for the investment of taxpayer dollars. In the Arctic, the U.S. needs Swiss Army knife solutions, cheap, durable, and useful for accomplishing many different tasks. On a single patrol, a U.S. Coast Guard icebreaker might demonstrate sovereignty, respond to a search and rescue case, and support scientific research. The ability of Coast Guard assets to perform multiple missions in the Arctic simultaneously advances multiple national interests in the spirit of the national strategy for the Arctic region's emphasis on whole-of-government solutions. In conclusion, there are both strategic and practical reasons to fully resource the Coast Guard's Arctic missions. The Coast Guard is a highly useful tool for conducting integrated deterrence, campaigning, and engaging in strategic competition. For example, the Coast Guard could partner with Denmark and Greenland to build capacity and enhance maritime domain awareness, strengthening our relations with these important allies. More importantly, the Coast Guard should develop a strategy for conducting and resourcing integrated deterrence and campaigning operations. The Arctic region provides an ideal testbed for developing and implementing integration concepts with global applicability. The Coast Guard is a useful means of meeting the complex threats to U.S. security interests and to ensuring a stable and open international system, but only if it can clearly identify a path forward and justify additional resources. 
the Coast Guard should be asked to proactively articulate a coherent, specific, and rigorous strategic vision for its role in advancing U.S. strategic ends in the Arctic. Thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Pincus. Uh, Dr. Grabowski, you may proceed. Good morning, Ch Chairman Carbajal, Ranking Member Gibbs, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today in this hearing addressing Coast Guard leadership in the Arctic. I've had the privilege of being associated with the National Academies for 30 years, and I just completed my second tour as chair of the Marine Board and the Transportation Research Board. In 2014, I chaired the NASM Committee, sponsored by the Coast Guard and seven other organizations that focused on the nation's ability to respond to a catastrophic oil spill in the Arctic. I'm also a member of the current NASM Committee, examining the adequacy of Coast Guard statutory authorities to respond to novel uses of the maritime environment. Our committee work is in uh, process at present, and I'm not going to comment on it today. My focus today, however, are on three areas important for Coast Guard leadership in the Arctic. Maritime domain awareness, support for Coast Guard operations and personnel, and Coast Guard's needs for resilient physical, technological, and human infrastructure. Coast Guard needs to support U.S. missions in the Arctic depend on effective maritime domain awareness, which for the Coast Guard requires improved visibility of and access to vessel traffic information, as well as current nautical charts. Important to this is the Coast Guard's increasing need to adopt current and future-facing information technology and systems, as was highlighted in several recent GAO reports. Several studies have addressed the Coast Guard risks and challenges in the Arctic. Few efforts, however, have adopted systematic processes and advanced analytics with multi-party Arctic stakeholders to determine the impact and the risks of the accelerating changes that the Coast Guard is facing in the Arctic today and in the future. Operationally, changing Arctic traffic and environmental conditions will increase needs for Coast Guard emergency response, vessel safety, and environmental protection capabilities. Maritime resources and other rescue equipment and supplies for response are limited in the Bering Strait region. And as we've already heard, the Coast Guard is far from possible incident locations. Arctic missions are also going to require, as we've heard, new technology, certification, training, proficiency, and experiences as the Coast Guard increasingly adopts and regulates the use of uncrewed and autonomous maritime systems. Underlying effective operational support are robust, secure, and available communications, data, and infrastructure, real-time and longitudinal sea ice, charting, navigation, and shoreline effects data, and efficient and enterprise-wide data systems and advanced analytics capabilities, all of which are going to be a challenge for the Coast Guard. Coast Guard needs to support their environmental protection mission and oil spill response act activities are significant. Some of the NASM 2014 recommendations that were in that report have been addressed, such as a call for traffic evaluation in the Bering Strait and oil spill and emergency response training programs for local entities so that the Coast Guard and the communities can develop trained response teams in the local communities. But others, such as the call for increased Coast Guard presence and performance capability in the Arctic, establishment of a comprehensive, collaborative, long-term Arctic oil spill R&D program, and increased oil spill response infrastructure and marine facilities in the Arctic have not been. Finally, Coast Guard leadership in the Arctic depends on resilient physical, technological, and human infrastructure. Historically, investments in the Arctic have not grown with expanded Coast Guard responsibilities. As important will be the required investments in Coast Guard technology and human infrastructure that are important for a robust and resilient Coast Guard today and in the future. Coast Guard Arctic operations occur in a unique social and cultural setting that is reliant on partnerships with neighboring countries, Arctic nations, and the Arctic Council, as well as on partnerships with local organizations, the Arctic communities, and strong bonds within the Arctic communities and with Arctic stakeholders. The co-production of knowledge, policies, regulations, and programs with local stakeholders, indigenous groups, and community leaders is critical for Coast Guard success in the Arctic. Ultimately, a robust and resilient maritime infrastructure requires significant, long-term, and interdisciplinary Arctic research 
with partners that can benefit the Coast Guard as well as all of its Arctic partners. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Gibbs and members of the subcommittee, thank you again for the opportunity to testify before you on these important issues about Coast Guard leadership in the Arctic. The Coast Guard is a critical leader and a partner in the Arctic with increasing demands and missions stretching their capability and capacity. Your support of the Coast Guard's critical mission needs is essential for an effective Coast Guard today and in the future. Thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Grabowski. We will now move on to member questions. Each member will be recognized for five minutes, and I will start by recognizing myself. Dr. Pincus, the United States will not be able to match Russia's fleet of 40 Arctic icebreakers, nor should we try to as a nation with a shorter northern coastline and a more diverse fleet of subsurface and air tra transportation assets. What is a better metric by which to gauge the U.S. whole Arctic capacity than simply the number of icebreakers? And in addition to their investments in icebreaking uh, assets, how would you rate the United States investments in the emerging Arctic to that of Russia and China? You're starting with an easy question. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate your note that the U.S. will not and should not look for parity in terms of Russian icebreakers. The vast majority of Russian icebreakers are with a commercial purpose, and they're operated by Rosatom Float, which is a Russian uh, state-owned corporation. They have commercial purpose, although they could certainly be used in the event of a military contingency to provide logistic support to naval vessels, their purpose is commercial. And it's not a, a good comparison for what the U.S. Coast Guard icebreakers do in the Arctic. Um, nevertheless, the U.S. does need robust icebreaking capability. As a global power, we need to be able to project our power and presence around the world at the time and place of our choosing, including in both the Arctic and Antarctica. The fact that the two polar regions are um, very far apart means that to achieve both polar presences and to have sufficient redundancy to be able to respond in the event of any contingency affecting one of our icebreakers is the true metric. Do we have presence in both polar regions at the time and place of our choosing, year-round access, and do we have sufficient redundancy? And I believe those are the metrics the Coast Guard has used in developing its proposals for the Polar Security Cutter Program. The follow-on Arctic Security Cutter Program, I believe, will be more responsive to activity in the region. We're seeing ice diminish faster than scientific predictions had forecasted. So measured ice reductions are happening faster than our models had projected. That changes requirements for icebreaker access. With shrinking sea ice, we may be able to get by with lower powered icebreakers or a mix of ice hardened and ice breaking vessels. So I think that Arctic Security Cutter program will be in response to ice reductions as well as projections in activity. Looking holistically at investments in the Arctic region, I think we need to toggle to the strategic ends that we're trying to achieve. When it comes to securing U.S. waters, securing U.S. Um, citizens and people under our protection for maritime activity, that's an important metric. Can the Coast Guard observe, monitor, control, and respond to maritime activity, to growing maritime activity in the U.S. Arctic? We're seeing important growth in cruise tourism, so larger and larger vessels are coming into the region more frequently. That poses scale risks to our missions. We're also seeing changes in the seasonality and location of fishing. So fishing fleets are another important um, source of maritime casualties. There's increased air traffic in the region. So making sure that the Coast Guard can respond to human security is critically important. In addition, the Coast Guard needs to be able to exert domain awareness and assert sovereignty, as we saw with the Chinese and Russian naval vessels incurred, uh, incurring into our uh, EEZ. We need to be able to respond, to communicate that that activity, that foreign activity in our EEZ does not have free reign. Nevertheless, I would 
emphasize that the Arctic is not the top U.S. strategic priority. Our priority is the Indo-Pacific, and it's Europe. As a secondary theater, every investment is going to be toggled within that framework. Again, I believe that argues well for Coast Guard presence. Um, but I, I would encourage um, Congress to look at U.S. capabilities in the Arctic in light of our global priorities and scale them to respond to our multiple national objectives, human security, environmental security, securing economic assets, asserting sovereignty. Um, and I believe that's the framework within which we could accurately make those measurements. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very thorough answer. Uh, Dr. Grabowski, we know commercial traffic has been and will continue to increase in the Arctic as the ice caps melt. Would you please expound on the consequence of underfunding the Coast Guard for its environmental missions, such as fisheries enforcement and pollution response? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that question. So the consequences of underfunding the Coast Guard in its Arctic mission are, are seen at multiple levels. At a local level, a failure to fully fund the Coast Guard for its oil spill response and, um, and vessel response capabilities has an impact at the local level. Indigenous populations and Arctic villages across the Arctic depend on clean air and clean water and the animals and species that live in the air, on the land, under the water, and on the water. And so there is a risk to the local population of underfunding Coast Guard missions. At a national level, it is important for the Coast Guard to be fully funded with respect to its environmental responsibility capabilities, because if it is not, trade-offs occur. And the question then becomes, which of the 11 statutory Coast Guard missions is more important? And so when trade-offs occur because of underfunding, the, the uh, missions of the Coast Guard are not met fully. And, and the nation suffers. And then finally, globally, there's an impact if we don't fulfill our missions with respect to environmental responsibility because the voice of the United States within international fora with respect to environmental response is the vo voice of the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard is our voice of the nation at the International Maritime Organization, at the International Association of Lighthouse Authorities, where vessel safety and vessel navigation standards and regulations are established, and within the oil spill and the fisheries communities. So at many different levels, underfunding the Coast Guard with respect to oil spill responsibilities has impacts locally for the nation and then globally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I will now recognize uh, Representative Gibbs. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to kind of tie two questions together. I'll start with Ms. Pincos. Um, you, you, your answer there, you covered a lot of it, but I guess I'm really concerned about, you know, what the future holds with Russia and China. And you talked a lot about the commercial interest, and we don't have a lot of redundancy or resilience up there, and our infrastructure needs help. Um, and from a national security standpoint, you know, what do you think um, the actions this administration could undertake to counter some of these activities of Arctic, uh, Russia and China and the Arctic, and, and uh, what's your biggest fear? You talked a lot about commercial, but also from the strategic interest, and then tying that in with the Arctic Council, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Kravosky can answer too. Um, you know, we see with uh, Russia, um, you know, was, the council's kind of been suspended, I guess, because of the Ukrainian situation. You know, what do you see moving forward with that and how that ties in with our relationship with Russia and China and the Arctic and, and you know, I guess just kind of put your vision, your glasses on and see what you kind of, and what, you know, we can anticipate and what maybe we should be looking for in the future legislative-wise or, or the administration to address these issues with, especially Russia and China. Thank you for the question. To lead off, um, when it comes to the Arctic Council, I think I have been reassured in speaking with Norwegian counterparts in the last few weeks, um, while there had been some concern about the transition from the Russian chairmanship to the Norwegian chairmanship, which is going to take place in May of this year, um, Norwegians seem less anxious than they were. They seem, they seem to feel fairly confident that that transition will happen um, and happen smoothly, which reassures me that we will soon be in an Arctic Council led by Norway, where there will be um, more opportunities available to continue its important work. 
When it comes to Russia and China, I think that is the, um, that's the $64,000 question. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine of Crimea in 2014, the imposition of Western sanctions in 2015, we saw a really clear pivot by Russia east towards partnering with China, taking Chinese investment, using Chinese ships to ship through their northern sea route. Um, it was sort of an unintended second order effect of that sanctions package. Following the imposition of sanctions this year, Russia's further invasion of Ukraine, China has been less, um, it has to a large extent complied with these sanctions, particularly its larger banks and state-owned corporations have been in compliance. No Chinese vessels have sailed through the northern sea route in 2022. That's significant. Wait, you say they get no Chinese vessels, what? No Chinese vessels have sailed through Russia's northern sea oh, okay. route in 2022. Okay. So that's really interesting. Russia um, is trying to win back that Chinese investment and partnership in developing its Arctic. It needs outside capital and technical know-how to do so. It's also been seeing alter alternate partners. So it's been seeking partnership with India and Vietnam and other non-Arctic states. The extent to which the Chinese-Russia relationship deepens or not in the next year or two is very significant. Um, that's what I'm watching. It's hard to tell where that relationship is going. We've seen some mixed messages. Obviously, there was you know, the declaration of no limits friendship in January of last year, which immediately preceded Russia's invasion. Since then, there have been some mixed messages. Um, should a more full-fledged relationship between them appear? Should their um, joint military exercises deepen into something closer to a military relationship or alliance? We could have a significant challenge in the Arctic region and beyond, of course. Um, but as of yet, I think we have some reason to hope that the natural frictions in that relationship continue to keep them at arm's length. Um, nothing unites like a common enemy. So it's important for US foreign policy that we watch that relationship yeah. very carefully. I mean, Thank you. Dr. Kropowski, do you want to uh, comment on the Arctic Council? Or, or... Thank you for the second half of the, of the uh, question. Clearly, our partnerships um, with the Arctic Council, with Arctic nations, and with all our partners across the Arctic are, are very important. And so monitoring developments as relationships uh, develop and wax and wane is clearly important. It's significant to note that even though there have been disconnects at the Arctic Council, the operational working relationships for people on the ground with respect to oil spill response, for instance, have continued to develop. And so District 17 and Sector Anchorage, uh, the Coast Guard uh, representatives in the Arctic, will tell you that those conversations still exist despite the discussions that are occurring at higher levels. That's reassuring from an environmental responsibility because as we all know, oil doesn't respect international boundaries. And if there's an event, it's important that all hands show up. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thanks for being here. You're back. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. I now recognize uh, Representative Garamendi. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, Ms. Pincus, you were responding to a question from the chairman that uh, analyzed the role of the Coast Guard in the Arctic. And as I was trying to follow along on your responses, you were suggesting there's a series of things that need to be done. The uh, Coast Guard has its Arctic strategy. The Air Force, the Army, and the Navy have an Arctic strategy, uh, which perhaps you agree with me or not, are sophomoric, maybe freshmen. Um, I would appreciate your analysis of those strategies in detail and your recommendations on what would be a fulsome strategy for the United States in the Arctic including uh, the environmental issues, which have been discussed here, um, but also the international competition issues. Um, so if you can deliver that to this committee, I don't know, maybe Friday of this week, uh, we really need to know. We really need to uh, lay out an Arctic, um, we need to force those agencies to develop a good, strong, comprehensive Arctic strategy that, as you said, endorse, that coordinates. So if you can do that in the remaining minute and a half or uh, provide a paper on it, it would be very, very helpful. 
you heard, you heard the conversation I had with the uh, with regard to icebreakers. Um, so help us. Thank you. Um, I I appreciate your analysis, and I agree. I think the service strategies. Um, can be improved. And I would point to the National Defense Strategy and the classified portions of the NDS as providing a realistic framework that prioritizes top-level priorities and deprioritizes and accepts risk for low-level priorities. And that's really important. Um, and the classified version contains additional metrics by which those priorities and success or failure can be measured. And I think that's also very useful. And um, perhaps Arctic strategies, service strategies, Coast Guard strategies should be, um, sh should have more significant classified sections that would permit a more frank analysis, but that frank analysis is necessary because of the cost involved and because of the competing priorities that must be adjudicated. Um, I think there's good reasons why the Coast Guard is a um, value-added way to achieve national objectives in the Arctic given urgent DOD priorities. But I would agree with you that's a strategy, and a robust, specific, um, measurable strategy that includes yardsticks and timelines is the first step before any other resourcing, because that's what justifies the resources, and that's how you, a service can be held accountable. Um, and I would be happy to uh, provide further analysis to your office. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I, I would appreciate that, but I think the members of the committee would also, and certainly the chairman. Uh, so please, um, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, not seeing any more um, questions. That concludes our hearing for today. I would like to once again thank all the witnesses for uh, their testimony today. The contributions to today's discussion have been very informative and helpful. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided uh, answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered, the subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs>